Okay, let's make a start. So. Good day, yeah. So let's make a start. This week, um, we're, uh, Dave wanted to have an application of geovisualisation in terms of um, academia. So uh, I'm going to do a talk this week on the Journal of Maps. So the Journal of Maps, uh, which I'm an, the editor of, is an international journal for publication, as the uh, title would suggest, of maps. Um, so that's a URL to the journal, which is published by Taylor and Francis. And it's, as a journal, designed to focus upon, not surprisingly, the map, but um, uh, it's a traditional academic journal. So you have an um, article or a manuscript, as you won't have with any other journal, but now that simply describes the focus of the manuscript, which is the map itself, which forms a secondary or supplementary file. And in terms of the Journal of Maps, what's it, what it's concerned with is spatial data in absolute broader sense and its presentation to a wide audience. So whilst a paper-based map or a flat two-dimensional map might well be the um, most common type of output for it, it's actually about the presentation of any kind or visualisation of any kind of spatial data. Uh, and that's actually got to be within the context of a research output. It's got to be a bespoke map that's been produced and you've added some value to it. So simply taking some census data and producing a coral plate map like you might have done in the second year um, isn't good enough to be considered as a, a bespoke research product. So what I'm going to do is go through a range of um, maps to give you some examples of them and also to highlight um, the range of data products and the different types of maps that they, people have produced. Some of the context to the Journal of Maps then, um, because it's a journal, um, if you go to any journal website when you download an article, it will always be a PDF. You can view it as an HTML document, but it will always be a PDF. And that's one of the stipulations for uh, journals is that they have to produce PDFs that are archived then um, forever. So whereas now uh, in the past if we look at a journal that was published 100 years ago, we can go back and look at the printed version, say the British Library, with a PDF now every single publisher deposits a version, uh, the version of the PDF in an international library so that it can forever be gone back to and looked at. So that's one of the constraints for publishing, is that you need to have a PDF if you're going to um, archive it. So one of the requirements we have is that a map has to be produced as a PDF. So just like a, a, an ordinary article, um, ac academic would write their manuscript, submit it to the journal, and then it gets peer-reviewed. So it goes to, uh, in our case, three reviewers. So we have two academic reviewers, who will probably be academics at other universities, and they will read the manuscript, look at the map, and give an opinion as to what they think about the work that the person has written about. The map itself then goes to a professional cartographer, and the cartographer actually provides a review purely of the map itself. Um, the author of the manuscript has to write a section about how they've designed the map and why, which again is probably not too dissimilar from the 250 words you would have done for your portfolios. It'd be justifying what they've done and the cartographic reviewer will actually assess that. They also need to state the software that they've used. Remember a lot of science is about be about reproducibility of results and certain uh, aspects of processing or presentation are quite important so we make sure that the authors say exactly what software has been used. So let's look at uh, what I want to do for the rest of the session really is to look through a range of maps so, uh, so I'll post these slides up on Study Space. At the bottom here um, is the URL to the article online. We subscribe to the journal at Kingston, so you're about to access all of these. So this actually was our best map winner from 2011 or 12, I forget now, uh, and was produced by a group of MSc students at the University of uh, Vilnius, I think. 
um, and was submitted by their course director for that program. And this shows you, uh, as the title says, a map of conflict in the 21st century in Europe. So there's a couple of different databases that are compiled about conflict, all sorts of different types of conflict. Um, it could be acts of terrorism, it could be um, uh, economic or commercial conflict, social conflict, things like uh, um, religious conflict. Um, and those databases were compiled by these students into one large data set, and that's where they added the value. And then they presented uh, a whole range or a map showing those conflicts just for Europe. Uh, on the left here, they've tabulated um, a range of, not, these aren't all of the um, data in the database, this is just a sample of them, so that you can see them. They've obviously provided some ancillary graphs, and then they've got quite a complex, and if we zoom in on that, they've got quite a complex key, which is designed to show the different types of conflict, um, hopefully relatively clearly. Uh, the first thing that jumps out at me, I was thinking when I was looking at this, um, uh, it does say in there, you can't see it from the screen grab, but the number of um, uh, conflict events, uh, how dangerous Russia seems to be. And strangely, I was actually talking to the author of this this week, and uh, uh, his comment was that uh, didn't Europe seem like a peaceful place in the first decade of the 21st century compared to how far we are in now in 2015? Uh, the design of the map feels quite oppressive and overbearing, and it's designed to be because it's showing conflict. It's not harmonious on the eye at all, but it is intended to show um, the data on conflict relatively clearly. So it's quite a big compilation of data behind this, and quite a complex map to produce it. Uh, so, just to, some of the notes from here. Three teams of MSc students in cartography um, in 2006, 8 and 10 totaled approximately 4,000 hours of uh, person hours of work in compiling and producing the map. Uh, so, it's a significant uh, piece of work. That's why it won our best map. Okay, moving on. Uh, this, then, is a completely different type of output now. We've moved from a database of conflict to what is now a model, uh, paleogeography of Europe during the last 20,000 years. Now, this is a purely physical model that has been calibrated and run for Europe, and it's run over a range of different time slices. Um, the team feeding into this... Uh, it's got a half a dozen authors there, I think. I've, I have a feeling this team was bigger here. Um, deliberately presented here so that you can very rapidly see the change in um, uh, ice cover over that period and how sea level changed. So you can see uh, at the top, starting at 20,000 years, and it gets younger and younger and younger and younger, all the way through to 4,000 years, and you can see the ice sheet receding from Europe and um, the sea levels uh, gradually rising. Um, again, quite a simple map. Each of those are outputs from the model. So there's a huge amount of work has gone into the climate modelling behind this, and then the outputs are standardised products from that, compiled into a single sheet. Now this actually forms two pages in the uh, map, and here you've got ice sheet thickness modelled as well. So the previous one was sea level, um, and uh, it, you've got uh, uh, above and below past, scene mele, past mean sea level, whereas here we've got ice sheet thickness. So there's some quite complex physical modelling behind this to produce a fair series of relatively simple maps that are designed to make it very easy to understand how um, northern Europe has changed over the last 20,000 years. Okay, complete change now. Now, yeah, we've got a clicking. I think we've got some feedback, haven't we, from the speaker. It's either that or a bomb. It's about to go. Um, now, this is a political map. No data underlying this at all. And uh, this uh, thought long and hard before we sent this to review. Um, and these authors uh, presented this at a... Um, 
exhibition in Taiwan about allowing people in Taiwan to comment on and visualise how Taiwan's presented in the media. Now, typically, you would use some kind of transverse Mercator or, um, or just a standard Mercator projection to view um, this part of Asia. And you would often see China being the biggest part with Taiwan, simply a tiny speck on the bottom of it. And what they've done here is change the projection to get people to think about Taiwan's position. So now, instead of becoming a tiny little island next to China, it now becomes the centre of the map and the vastness of the Pacific Ocean and the countries that border it. And it completely changes the way that you visualise and view Taiwan. This is designed to make a political statement first and foremost and to get people to think about it. Again, if you think back to cartography last year, maps are used extensively for politics. And this is a very nice example of how that's done. It also comes from a completely different style of cartography. So this is done, obviously, by uh, a group of Taiwanese um, researchers. And this is designed um, uh, uh, within a context that they'll be familiar with uh, producing maps. OK. Moving on back now to another physical geography map. This is uh, quite different again. Um, and some of these maps you'll be looking at and thinking they're not so much like topographic maps, maybe. Some of them are more like posters. Some of them are political maps, a bit more art in design. This is very much more like a poster. But it does actually give a nice example of some of the problems you'll face in mapping certain types of topics. So here we're talking about mapping coastal retreat. Now, we've got a, a linear map here because all we're interested in is coastline, and that creates a problem because we've got something thin and long, and how do you show that on a map um, without just having a long, thin map? And that's the problem this map faces. And in fact, for coastal retreat, how do you just show the amount of change in coastline over time? So the solution here is to have a um, location map to show you each, where each of these sections are. And then they've used aerial photography here instead of a map so that you can visualise the coastline. And then for each section of that, we now have um, essentially a histogram that also uh, is coloured in terms of the intensity of erosion at those points. And you can very quickly pick out um, the amount of retreat that's been taking place. So this is metres per year with 0.8 of a metre per year at the uh, uh, most, um, at the highest parts of erosion. And you can see around Berlin Gap here, we have 0.8 of a metre of erosion at this point per year. So, you know, you're talking about nearly a metre a year, 10 metres a decade, which this coastline is retreating. And that really stands out nicely. Um, so... A lot of thought has gone into how you present this. Now, I think probably uh, it could perhaps, in terms of the layout of the map, be um, uh, produced slightly better than that. But it's a difficult map to produce because you've got nine sections. Um, they've tried to lay it out in approximately the same orientation as they appear on the coastline. And you are always going to have a problem with fitting this map together and how to fill the space. It's a diff very difficult map to produce, but it presents the case quite clearly in terms of coastline retreat. Um, the background to this map, in terms of the amount of information that's gone into it, is quite a lot. It shows um, data going back 125 years using historical um, ordnance survey mapping. So we have, um, I don't know how many time points they took, but um, there's probably in excess of um, five to ten time points and they've digitised every single coastline for those time points and then calculated the change over time. So there's a huge amount of value added in terms of work that's gone into this. OK. So uh, the next map, this is actually an atlas called um, the Forgotten Capital, um, uh, which is Sandwich in Ontario. And this is uh, an interesting part of the world because, let's have a look at an example of it, it spans the Detroit River. And this is an international boundary between Canada and the US. 
which then means you have completely different maps um, covering this area. So if you have US maps, they'll only cover the US side of the border. If they have Canadian maps, they'll only cover the Canadian side. If you're interested in this whole area, you're not going to have one map that covers it all. So this project was specifically concerned with compiling a set of maps that brought the US and Canadian maps together to form a single sheet and looking at that through time to see how the area developed. Uh, it covers a range of different topics, um, both through time and also looking at things like transportation, housing, um, for example. Uh, what's, uh, this won our best map in, I think it was 2008 or 9, an atlas of about 20 pages. Uh, what's unique about this one is that um, it was produced by a pair of undergraduate students for their dissertation. And they not only had it published in um, the Journal of Maps, but they won the best map prize and had it printed as a result of that. Okay, so this map is co-authored by the one and only Ian Greatbatch. This is his uh, sole map in the Journal of Maps. Now, has anyone heard of Blanding's Castle? One? Okay, you're obviously not. So this is a, a fictitious location. Uh, is a location um, in P.G. Woodhouse's um, uh, novels set in this area. Now, um, it was always set in Shropshire, and, but uh, it's a fictional location, and there was never any description of exactly where it was set, other than it was in Shropshire. And there's been lots and lots of uh, people who have tried to say whether there was actually a location where it really was, or whether it was simply a, a sort of mix of different types of um, locations that he made up. Well, slightly tongue-in-cheek, what Ian and his colleague uh, Daryl did was um, scan through all of the books relating to Shrop uh, Blandings and pull out any geographical information related to its potential location. They then did a weighted overlay within ArcGIS to produce uh, where they thought the most likely location for Blandings Castle was. Um, so uh, what we have now is the weighted overlay for Shropshire produced here and in the um, paper they talk about exactly which criteria they've used. So for example, one of them is in one of the books it talks about it being something like a, a 20 minute um, carriage ride away from the railway station. So uh, they looked at whether a railway station was located and then they looked at the average speed of carriages um, uh, for that period and then worked out how far someone could have driven in that period of time. So there's a, a, a range of criteria that's being used. And then the box here, the zoom-in box, shows the most likely location for Blanding's Castle. So in terms of research, this is slightly tongue-in-cheek. It's um, far more in terms of public interest. And that was one of the reasons why we decided um, to publish this one, was because uh, there's a good public interest in understanding things like weighted overlay, which uh, uh, most of the public won't have come across in terms of solving spatial problems. It's quite a nice example of that. Okay, uh, shift to something completely different again. Back to something now that is uh, physically based, and this is um, using remotely sensed data for the world, looking at the phenology of uh, um, uh, not just North America, uh, but the phenology of plants through all of the different continents, presented um, on individual pages like this. So there were separate ones for South America. Um, uh, I'm trying to think how many continents they did, but Africa, Europe, I did Asia as well. And the amount of data that has gone into this um, is vast. So you're talking about um, a compilation of satellite imagery for the whole globe, and then the calculation of, and these are six different indices for measuring vegetation, calculation of six different indices um, for each of those continents. And then the presentation of that and a discussion around it. It's a huge amount of data that has gone into this. 
So again, it's thinking about, in terms of publication, what is value added? So if you were to simply produce a compilation of Landsat data for the globe, um, that's not a particularly significant value added, or at least it isn't anymore because it's relatively straightforward to do. But the calculation of um, vegetation indices uh, by continent is a significant amount of work and has got some considerable amount of thought that's gone into the production of this. Uh, so let's zoom into one of those. So this shows an example. Uh, I can't remember um, uh, what the shift index is, uh, but there are six different indices. And you can uh, see in terms of the um, uh, legend um, picking out the different areas of change. And that's the big thing to note here. They're trying to pick out change um, uh, for this, these data sets. to something human again. Now this is a map showing um, human development in the US. Now human development is an index that's used by the United Nations to try to map out um, uh, uh, positive aspects of society and how they're changing. So again it's a compilation index of a range of different measures uh, which includes, and I'm trying to remember Things like um, health, education, I forget, I'm sure it's four different criteria that are used for human development. And it's been particularly used by the UN because they want to highlight different regions that are suffering from um, different types of problems related to the development of uh, humans as a race. Um, so it would be things like war zones as well as education and health and um, uh, nutrition. Typically, these are recorded at a national scale, so you can compare countries to one another and see relatively how they're performing against each other. And for the UN, it allows them to target different countries. Now, this is preferred because um, in the past, one of the main ways of comparing countries has, for example, been um, gross domestic product. So how much money does a country earn? But actually, the amount of money a country earns doesn't necessarily indicate how developed it is as a, as a human, but in terms of human development. And um, one of the well, one of the countries that's led in terms of considering more about human development has been Bhutan, which has got something like 50 different measures of happiness. Um, and we think of happiness as being a slightly trite term. But it's very serious in terms of things like workplace happiness, um, family happiness, uh, and thinking about uh, well-being from that perspective. Rather than money deriving happiness, which I think most people would, um, uh, would think about earning money, but they don't necessarily think it derives happiness, Human Development Index is trying to tap into something that better measures um, populations. So what this author did um, was... Uh, apply it to the US, which wouldn't necessarily be the first place you're thinking of applying it, um, and did it at the sub-national level. So he managed to acquire data for counties across the US, which is what you see presented here, and they've mapped human development, and then they've done some uh, uh, Ord-Gettys clustering analysis to see if there's any clusters of low and high human development. And what's interesting here... Uh, and perhaps not too surprising, is you see this massive cluster in the U.S. southeast and southern states um, of low development. And then you see these clusters um, in the northeast around New York, which is probably not too surprising, over on the west coast around L.A., San Francisco. And interestingly, um, I wasn't expecting to see such big clusters across the Midwest in the U.S. either. Uh, this is nice because it is genuinely um, socially useful because it can feed directly back into politicians. This is at a relatively fine resolution in terms of US counties that you can actually start to say something meaningful across a country um, about human development. Ah, here we go. So we've got health, which is life expectancy in years, 
education and resources, so it has personal income as well. So they're the three criteria it uses. Okay, something completely different again. Has anyone seen one of these? So this is called a tree map. And if you've ever wondered why your hard drive is full of loads and loads of rubbish and you want to clear it up, you'll find that there's a number of programs that produce tree maps of your hard drive. And the tree maps are sorted by size and directory. So you can rapidly see where all the space is being accumulated. Tree maps are particularly good for that type of data, hierarchical data, where you need to zoom into it. But this group from City University um, have focused upon using massive data sets, really, really big, to try to zoom in on some, um, or provide a focus on uh, spatial data, which is something you wouldn't normally use tree maps for. And each one of these is a postcode in London, and they're laid out approximately spatially. The uh, top one, uh, let's get this right, because you have to think, I have to think twice about looking at this. So this one then shows uh, the Farringdon postcode, and it's by day of the week, time of the day, and by different types of couriers. That's what these are. These are all um, deliveries. So you've got push bike, motorbike, uh, not quite sure, type, um, light van or van. Okay, uh, so that could be like a scooter, light motorbike, I think that might be what that is. So it's designed to show you for this postcode when you have the highest density of um, tra traffic through those areas. When you suddenly realise that's what it's showing, each square, it's a vast amount of data. Um, I'm trying to think, does it say... So this is from eCourier UK, uh, location, vehicle type, day of the week, hour of the day. Um, so that shows uh, colouring. The second one, here we go. Traffic density is pink, average speed is yellow. So that's what those two maps were. So let's go back to. So that's your average speed, and the top one is your traffic density based upon those routes. There's a huge amount of data in here. Um, I think they say in the paper exactly how many there are um, and how long a, a time period. It might well be a year for this. I've got a feeling it is. Um, it's just a vast amount of data that's laid out in a spatial format for London. And like I say, when you zoom in, you, you can see Mile End, Bethnal Green, Shoreditch. Um, so they've named each one. and They're all done by postcode unit. So that is a really complicated one to produce. I don't know what they use to produce it, actually, but it'll say in the paper. Um, and it's a really clever way of visualising that massive data set. Right. My last, my last example on this screen. This was a public... Um, uh, or try to get some more data out to the public. And this made the press quite a lot in the US. So this particular group have mapped the seven deadly sins in the Midwest, and they went on to produce seven deadly sins of the whole of the US. So it's very tongue-in-cheek. Um, but they have taken socioeconomic data, tried to map the socioeconomic data. So, for example, obesity is the one that uh, links into greed. Um, and they've, uh, so they've taken medical data for that and then mapped it across the Midwest region. Um, now, uh, it's really interesting taking this because it, it, it nicely helps explain things to the public, generally speaking. As an academic piece of work, it doesn't have a huge amount of value because it's, each of these terms are slightly vague. And you have to be incredibly careful with what you choose. So firstly, greed and obesity, are they the same thing? Well, um, it depends what your definition of greed is, and that's perhaps the problem with the seven deadly sins as words. Um, and some of them you have to be incredibly careful with because they can potentially offend large numbers of people. 
So the one for lust uh, was sex-related crimes, I think. And you have to be very careful about how you define that and what it actually means. Um, uh, but for engaging people, it's a really nice piece of work to show. Um, uh, one, uh, how you map these things spatially. And two, um, how you take uh, socioeconomic data and bring some meaning from it. Sorry? Uh, so the, the red one is uh, clusters, and then the other one is um, intensity. So yeah, these right-hand ones are clusters. So I'll say I'll post these slides. Oh, it's just a zoom, didn't one? Yeah. You'll see at the end the references for those. What I want to do is just show you a couple of other maps as well. So let's go back to here. Let's take you to the main website so you can see it. So, journal maps, dump you here. Um, you've got the best maps listed at the top there, some of the more popular ones. When you search here, then, it'll um, take you to whatever uh, maps you're interested in. So, let's look at this one. Right, mental mapping the creative city. So, as I said, we don't... Uh, paper maps, as you've seen from those examples there, are the most common ones. And it should give you an example of the complete range of material that people are producing maps of. Bear in mind, these are all bespoke research-based maps. Now, to access the article, it's subscription-based journal, but the maps themselves are all full into the supplemental materials, which um, anyone can actually access, so you don't need to be in the university to look at the maps themselves. So let's download this one. That's fast broadband for you. Two, two academics who could be from anywhere in the world to a specialist in that area, plus one professional cartographer. Now, what you've got to remember looking at those maps is that for most of them, there won't be cartographers at all. And 
I would say we have some cartographers who submit maps. So normally the standard is very, very good. But for 95, 98% of the material submitted, they're not cartographers. Sometimes the quality is quite poor. Um, and one of the places where a lot of that value is added is in the improvement in the maps that are produced. For a lot of these people, they're learning as they go through the process. Um, the professional cartographer normally provides a um, detailed review, and quite often the map will go through one, two, and possibly even three rounds where it's edited each time to improve it. Some maps are clearly better than others. Uh, and the Journal of Maps isn't about having the best maps around, because it's not a cartography journal. And it's not necessarily about having the most groundbreaking research around, because it's not a subject-specific journal. But it is about presenting very good research-based maps from um, researchers who are usually not cartographers. That suddenly shot down, didn't it? Blimey. It's the least interesting part of the lecture. At least I hope so. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it might not be a masterpiece. It was very different, though. perspective it's not the most exciting map to look at but so one of the things that Acrobat lets you do is create three-dimensional models so they've obviously created this is actually a, it's an interesting paper because it looks at Darwin in Australia which is a bit of a creative city I haven't read this and it looks at um, interviewing various people uh, in different sectors and mapping out in the city then where the most creative parts of it are. Um, so this is the is measure of inspiration uh, and then presenting it as a three-dimensional surface. So we have got constraints at the Journal of Maps in terms of the PDF presentation online. But that's not to exclude that there are a whole range of visualisations that we want to include. So, for example, we do have people who've presented fly-throughs. I was going to show you one of those, but it might take about 15 minutes to download it. Um, uh, and there's quite a nice... We've got several fly-throughs of both human and physical-based maps. Quite a nice geology-based one where they fly through the terrain, which has been overlaid with the geology map. And that's embedded in the PDF. So that's one of the nice things about PDFs, is that they support the embedding of a range of um, materials in them. So you can embed audio, you can embed video, you can embed three-dimensional models. And in fact, in some of the papers, we've also embedded the um, uh, raw data that is behind the map as well, so that the data accompanies the map at the same time. You don't have to go and look for it somewhere else. Um, we've also had uh, a number of people that have submitted web maps, um, either Flash-based ones or HTML-based ones, for review. Now, you, you can't... We thought long and hard about how best to present that, and there's no easy solution to it. Uh, one, uh, trying to try to have a, a solution where you could present the results from a web map um, is difficult. And probably the only way around that would be a virtualized machine, which had the software installed on it. Um, you have links to the existing version, and when the map is submitted, they work, but that doesn't mean they'll work 15 years in time. So the solution we've decided to adopt for that is that we normally have videos embedded 
that have a demonstration of the web map so that people can actually see them in action um, without necessarily being able to use them themselves. So a range of different visualizations, there's lots of people interested in them. And the problem that faces publishing is actually how best to present that to um, people that are interested in reading about it and how best to archive that for future generations as well. And I'd say there isn't an easy solution to that. And that's in part thinking, and this is why PDF is used, because it's going to be supported for a very, very long time and it's very well understood. And we have problems where data is becoming orphaned and is not available a relatively short time after it was used. And probably the best example of that is the BBC's um, Doomsday Project. So in the UK, uh, in the year 1000, they created a Doomsday book, which was essentially uh, written a thousand years ago and designed to um, uh, provide a, a census or a summary of the whole of the UK. So what the BBC did in the uh, late 80s, and like 85, 87, were, wanted to do a multimedia version of that where schools fed in and essentially for the whole of the UK provided a snapshot of UK life with audio, with video, um, images, a bit like a, a, a Wikipedia of the UK. And um, there wasn't any internet for multimedia back then. And they used a lay, early version of a laser disc and they were selling systems then to schools so they could use it. Within five years of its release, after it was completed, um, it was obsolete. There was no hardware that existed in school to read it, and all of that data could not be um, accessed by anyone. So the subsequent 15 years were then spent in various formats trying to research it and trying to find a way of restoring it and saving it. So that was a product in five years that went from full multimedia to not being able to be accessed. And that's the problem that things like this face, if you're not careful, is putting them in formats that nobody can read. So PDF isn't necessarily the best format for using the data, but it's a very good one for archiving it. And again, one of the problems you face, a map like this, if you wanted to create the exact same symbolization, you can't without starting from scratch because it's not an arc map document. There's no um, style information that accompanies this. And that's the problem of PDF, but the benefit is that you still have this reproducibility that you can show as it was produced. Sorry. 